Okay, so let's go over to England now. We're moving on to lecture guide number 14. And we'll go through England fairly quickly uh, and then spend a little bit more time in Germany and in Spain. <clears throat> so just a, a quick one. This is Joseph Wright of Darby's famous The Experiment on a Bird with an Air Pump. And um, what you're witnessing here is, <clears throat> well, it's a, a kind of teaching moment they're doing this experiment where they're pumping all of the air out of this little uh, you know, glass sphere in order to create a vacuum. And as they do it, of course, they're showing everyone how this works and what happens to the bird when you do this. So the bird kind of collapses and then they fill it back up, collapses, fill it back up. The little girls are shielding their eyes. They can't stand it because as we all know, of course, by this time, the stereotype that women are emotional and men are rational is very much in play here. Um, other people are kind of witnessing this. The mad scientist, so to speak, is running the experiment. It's a subject that's very closely associated with enlightenment, with scientific investigation, but it's rendered in a very romantic way to up the theatricality. Very, very tenebristic scene, light in the center, all these emotional qualities around it. By the way, every once in a while they would take out too much of the pressure and the bird's blood would just boil because of course boiling point lowers. Anyway, it's a horrible thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I literally today took out, because we were a little bit, I didn't want to get behind at the end of the quarter, I took out about five pictures by this guy, but this is George Tubbs, Stubbs, excuse me, lion attacking a horse. And it's, it was his bread and butter scene. He, uh, George Stubbs is an interesting character to me because he started off as a portrait painter, but not portraits of people. He painted portraits of people's horses. Uh, so he was like one of those guys who had a little niche business there. He went to rich people and said, oh, what's your favorite horse? I'll paint a portrait of that. Then he took a trip to North Africa where he apparently witnessed a lion attack a horse. And it, it happens basically at the same time period that Edmund Burke, this famous uh, Scottish philosopher, was writing his major treatises about the sublime. And we've covered this before, but the sublime is that kind of competing, alternating feeling of awe and exhilaration and smallness and vastness all together, this kind of overpowering sensation. And he thought, wow, this is the sublime, this massive, powerful cat taking down this horse and witnessing this whole thing, the terror of that, the exhilaration all bound together. And he just painted it over and over and over again. Oh, Jesus. Forgot. Every once in a while I forget who's in here next. This is John Fuseli. And... Um, I'm going to try to be as nice as I can about John Fuseli. He had a really, really uh, productive career, and he cultivated, he's one of the very first of the, especially English uh, painters, to cultivate this kind of persona of the crazy bohemian artist that fit in really nicely with Romanticism's exploration of the irrational. And what I mean by that is that whether or not he was, he certainly pushed the idea that he was like on the edge of being actually socially acceptable in the world um, by painting not only crazy pictures, but acting fairly oddly in public. And I'll give you one example of that. This is a work that's called The Nightmare. And the basic subject comes from Swiss mythology that says that young virgins are tormented by erotic dreams when nightmares, which are horses, horses of the dream realm, transport to their bedchambers these little incubi, or incubus for singular, which is a little kind of devil who, again, his, his job is to torment young virgins by filling their thoughts full of, or their dreams full of lustful thoughts. And of course, just see how this plays. I mean, we have this fantasy around forever. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is about, but kind of the innocent, virginal woman who nonetheless is very desirous, very eroticized. In this picture, what you're actually witnessing is her swooning in her sleep in desire of these erotic dreams 
that are being placed in her head by this incubi. During a time period, we're showing a woman in her bed itself is understood to be really erotic, let alone a virginal woman being, you know, tormented by lustful demons. In any case, this is one of those little dirty pleasures that as soon as it becomes an acceptable subject in art because romanticism allows it to be, a lot of people want to buy this, right? It's a, it's a kind of alternative to the Titian woman lying in the bed giving you a come-hither look and called a Venus figure. Now you've got the Swiss myth that authorizes this fairly uh, standard kind of male, uh, heterosexual male uh, fantasy picture. So far, whatever. The place that this gets really weird is in his own life, John Fuseli was smitten by this woman who was uh, of a higher station than him in the social circles. Her name was Anna Landholt. And she's important because there's an inscription on the back to her. And what happened here is that he pursued her. She basically got multiple cease and desist orders. He then explained to her uncle, because she wouldn't receive his letters, in a letter, that because he had had sex with Anna in a dream, they were, for all intents and purposes, actually married in the dream world. It was just a matter of time before it happened in this world. And if you're like, why are you telling me this? Well, part, I want you to know, hey, that's the cultivation of this persona of the bohemian weird artist. And the other part is, there is a chalk portrait drawing of Anna Landholt and his profession of love on the back of this painting. Watch out for artists, ladies. There's another one just to show you. Sin pursued by death. Big work, though. In England, the most important artist associated with Romanticism is Joseph Millard William Turner. And many, many, many of Turner's works look a little bit like this. And if this comes out of the blue for you, you're like, holy crap, what just happened? That's exactly what people at the time thought, too. Uh, Joseph Millard William Turner has precedence to him, but really... What he is doing so anticipates things that happen uh, you know, 20, 30 years later in Impressionism that this is one of the things that's so important about him. This is called Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying, or sometimes it's just called the Slave Ship. And what he's doing is he's trying, there's two things going on here that are important. One is he's trying to show you what a, a scene at sea in a storm with you know, dramatic light and dramatic clouds and lots of movements looks like, like what it really looks like. So he's anticipating Impressionism in the sense that when you experience something like this, it doesn't look like a cloud and it doesn't look like sun. It's all these fractured light here and drastic light over there and a little gray over here and so forth, the way that it looks to you. But the other side, which is not Impressionist at all and anticipates Expressionism, which we don't get to in this class, is he wants to paint the scene so that you feel what it feels like to be there, too. In other words, when he sets up the horizon line on this curious slant here, when he you know, fiddles with everything in the foreground so everything's in movement, where he has all of these striations and the clouds up above and so forth, he wants you to feel like you're at sea in the water, bouncing around amidst this storm, what that actually feels like, as well as what it looks like. Now, the subject is totally romantic. It's a scene that had happened or a subject that had happened about 15 years before he painted this. And here's what it's about. And the context here, again, is key. Some of you know that in Great Britain, they outlawed slavery fairly early on, at least by European standards. Uh, you know, the United States is one of the last to get on board with that, not easily, of course. And they outlawed slavery, but then they allowed people who were from Great Britain to make money off it nonetheless. You could still be a slave captain. You could own a corporation that basically traded in slaves. As long as you didn't put your ship into English ports of coal, you could do it. And everyone knew about it. And it was a huge hypocrisy. You could even buy insurance at big English insurance companies, including Lords of London, to insure your slaves, your cargo. And that's what this is about. Because what you could buy insurance for 
was only natural disasters. So if your slave ship went down in a storm, you could get some money back on that if you bought your insurance. What you couldn't get insured were all the things that you could solve for as a reasonable human being, such as not overcrowding these ships, not allowing the slaves to die of disease, actually feeding them. And in this case, what happened was that a slave ship was out. It's the slaves that were on board contracted a disease, which is completely common at the time. The captain sees when a storm comes up an opportunity to recoup some of his losses by tossing all of these dying slaves overboard and blaming it on the storm. This got found out about four years later by the insurance company. In a way, you're looking at the first documented case of insurance fraud, and it became big news. And as these arguments kept unfolding in Great Britain, in America, around abolition, around the hypocrisy in Great Britain, he decided to paint this scene. And he painted it in a way that, again, is supposed to show you what it looks like, what it feels like, and of course to rile you up enough that you want to change this, uh, you know, this approach to, um, or this hypocrisy in, in England. In the foreground, you can see all of these little shackled arms still with the rope shackles on them and various fish kind of gnawing on bodies. His most famous work is probably this, Rain, Steam, and Speed. Again, you haven't seen anything quite like this. This is about as painterly as it gets. Very, very loose brush strokes, very, very atmospheric. What we're witnessing here is a new, relatively new technology. Uh, it's the railways. And in this case, Joseph Millard William Turner got in a railway car, the car right behind the, um, the locomotive. And as this thing roared through the landscape going about 40 miles an hour, right, which is a, a fairly high speed for this day and age, he stuck his head out of the window and experienced both the blurring away of the landscape around him, which must have been a relatively new uh, kind of perception, as well as all the smoke, the sound, embers hitting him in the face and so forth, and then tried to paint that experience. What he does here is he adds a ton of atmospheric perspective, he accelerates that linear one-point perspective, has everything kind of blur with the movement of speed, so that you can not only see what his experience looks like, but feel what it felt like. Let's see what you can do with this. We're moving on to Germany now. We're just going to look at one artist associated with Romanticism in Germany, Caspar David Friedrich. And if I just give you one clue, that in Germany, as in the United States, the landscape and the Germans' connection to the landscape is a very important part of their national identity. That in Germany, um, you know, this was made use of by the Nazis in particular, but it predates them, the idea that blood and soil, or the Blut and Boten of the German people is tied up with their national identity. That if you think about every, frankly, well, just about every Germanic fairy tale you've ever heard of, where do they always take place? It's always in a forest, Black Forest, Teutoburg Forest, whatever it is. That the German myths of where they originated, how they first come together, are always taking place in forests as well. You've got a pretty good indication that when it comes to religiosity, Pantheism in Germany was a big idea, that God is part and parcel of the land. So here you have a work by Friedrich called Cross in the Mountains. It's also called the Tetchen Altarpiece. It was created for a Swedish king. He created this frame as well. I want you to try to interpret what's going on here, how this fits into the ideas of pantheism, you know, and all of the visual parallels that are going on in this work between the hill and other things. Turn to your neighbors and see how much you can interpret here.
Okay, so we start with a crucifixion scene, but how many people are like, probably not what the crucifixion looked like, right? So we've made some alterations to that to emphasize what? What is this work really all about? It's the major subject matter that you're looking at. Yeah. Nature. nature, right? Just nature, and not just any nature. This isn't just a little outcropping of rock. If you see this in person, what you're supposed to be witnessing is the very peak of some mountain. Right, so you're way up high looking at this. I keep seeing all these pictures because has everyone been following these stories about Mount Everest lately? And there's so many people going up that there's bottlenecking at the top and now we've got 11 dead in a year and they're still doing it. I'm like, what the hell? But they keep showing those glorious pictures of the peak of Everest. And it's a little bit like this. You're way up high witnessing this area that, of course, is supposed to be godly. And why? Well, if you know something about the history of culture and the history of religions, the very first of the the kind of religious areas for many different cultures is always high up on mountains, the thing that's closest to the sky. You think of some of the sculptural forms or architectural forms of many temples or things that are associated with religion in the afterlife from, you know, the ziggurats of Mesopotamia or the near ancient east, or pyramids, and by the way, just about every culture has had pyramids, they're all over the place, they're premised upon probably mimicking mountain forms. So here we've got the actual mountain. And what are mountains like? I mean, when you look down at Mount Rainier some days, how many people are like, I'm not exactly religious, but I see something pretty majestic and godly there, that's amazing, right? Big, powerful, awesome just kind of unbelievably large, which is that experience of the sublime, isn't it? And what did I say about the sublime? Well, the sublime, for people who are religious, is an indication of God in the world. Christians believe that their God is incredibly, infinitely complex, that their puny little human minds are never going to grasp that complexity, and yet they catch little glimpses of God in the world around them especially in nature, and there it is. Then you have a couple of other things. If this is a mountain peak, where are you supposed to be standing? In a classical work of art, of course, we would give you a spot that would very rationally be the standpoint by which you see the scene. Here you're floating off in space, and that's important. It's supposed to, again, engage you in a new way, make you feel like you're hovering in space, more inclined towards the religiosity of this picture. What also is being shown here? Other things associated with the sublime, right? That huge, vast sky with those powerful clouds. The light itself, light beams of the sun raising up. These are all manifestations of God, if you're a pantheist. Then you have evergreen trees and ivy climbing up the crucifix itself. These are both evergreens. If you've ever had ivy before, you know how tough it is to get rid of that. It's symbolic of resurrection. Yeah, he's dying now, but he will be resurrected. Remember what resurrection means too to everyone else. You also have the possibility of endless life in heaven if you follow his lead. How do you understand what he wants from you? Well, just like we said in... American landscape paintings commune with nature. That's what this is saying. And if I go back to the frame, which he made, or rather designed too, you'll see a whole bunch of the symbology playing out here as well. So down here below, you've got that pyramidal form that mimics the shape of the pyramidal form of the mountain, don't you? And within that, you have an eye and rays of sun like these rays of sun. Now, we ripped this entire thing off from the Egyptians, by the way. That's the old symbol of Ra. But what does it mean for Christians? It means the Trinity. Sun is life and God, light. And the one eye in there is the all-seeing eye of God who sees all things. And all of that is just mimicking this shape above. Then on one side you have, anyone see what this is? 
What is that? It's wheat. So what is wheat associated with? Bread. bread. So the Holy Communion again. The bread being the body of Christ. And then, no brainer, right? Over here, grapes. Associated with wine and the blood of Christ. But not showing you a chalice. Not showing you a loaf of bread. Rather showing you the natural material out of which those things are made. To once again, devil down on the idea that God is part and parcel of nature. Oh, I wish things were darker in here for a moment, but we're not going to do it. This is called Abbey in an Oak Forest, or sometimes it's called Cloister Graveyard in the Snow. Again, these titles are usually referred to afterwards. So this is one of those pictures that I love to death in person. One of the things that's very common with Cosper David Friedrich's work is this very lightly modulated field of slight tonal variations, particularly in the sky which is very meditative. When you look at this for a while, you almost, you just kind of sink in this almost trance-like state, which is what he's going for. He's going for some kind of, you know, put you into this religious state. <clears throat> the work itself shows you a ruin of a Catholic church, which is always recognizable by that pointed Gothic arch. You can barely make this out, but in the foreground, you have these uh, monks that are returning to this area, and there's a little graveyard over here in order to pay their respects to the fallen dead. And you also have these oak trees that, at this point, don't have any leaves on them, but we know that they're going to come back uh, in, the, you know, in the spring. And basically what this is about, which I used to have a really tough time trying to explain to people, is pretty straightforward. Uh, how many of you grew up and watched at least once The Lion King? All right, see, so I just say circle of life, and you're like, oh, yeah, got it, right? Things live, they grow, they die, they return to the soil to give life to other things. And that idea is what's being played up here. He's not the first to come up with it. This idea had been around for a very long time. It's part of what the Germans call Blut und Boden, or blood and soil, where the spirit of Germans is returned to the earth from which they came by being buried in that earth to give birth to future generations and so forth. Uh, and it's just generally speaking about this is the way that life works. This is the order of things. This is a self-portrait, believe it or not, of Friedrich. It's called Monk by the Sea. And once again, you get that. I mean, it's almost all about that and a little bit about that. And these are both indications of the sublime, right? What's more sublime than the never-ending sky? Where could that possibly end, that vastness? It's that thing that a lot of people point to when they say, hey, there's, there's an indication of the sublime. Everyone knows there's probably some answer to how space operates and where it begins and ends, except probably there is no beginning or end. That's just the wrong way to think about it. But we will never figure it out. Our puny human minds aren't going to get there. Here it is, surrounding you. What else is very sublime? I bet you everyone's had this feeling too. How many people, when you stand at the edge of the beach and just look out at the beach, especially if it's a quiet morning or something, kind of get chills running up your spine. There's just something incredibly powerful and magical, and you, know, you can't really put your finger on it. You can't say what that is, but it, it somehow connects you to something else. That's the sublime. Here he is, standing in this moment, witnessing, on the one hand, the vastness, the power of the universe. I mean, it's an amazing thing, right? When someone says to you, there are billions of stars, what does that even mean to you? Billions? I mean, billions of stars? The sea, right? The depths of that sea. What is in the sea? How come we keep finding new creatures in the sea still? And here he is contemplating that. On the one hand, it's vast and powerful and magical, and on the other hand, look at him. He's tiny, minuscule in the vastness of these things. And that's those competing feelings of the sublime. On the one hand, the vastness of all things and you being minuscule. On the other hand, you're one part of that vastness. So there's also this feeling of uh, connectedness. And that idea of the sublime can come in many kind of shapes and flavors. This is usually called the wreck of the hope or a sea of ice. It is inspired by William Perry's Arctic expeditions in which his ship, the hope, almost gets crushed in an ice flow. 
that's almost incidental to this, right? This is like those scenes that you can see today um, of the glaciers unfortunately melting and crashing into the ocean. These huge things, powerful forces that are at work in the universe. For these artists though, I, I wanna really make sure that this point is clear. Um, what they're trying to get at is that the sublime or nature is neither benevolent nor malevolent. It doesn't have it out for you and it's not going to be good to you. It just is. It's just immensely powerful and you don't matter in its schema at all. So if you happen to be caught in this flow of ice, so be it. It's not out for you. It's not going to save you. It just is. Here he's trying to emphasize the monumentality of all these things with this, uh, of course, huge crushing uh, blocks of ice in the foreground, lots of sharp pointy edges to this primarily diagonal form jutting up into the sky, all about movement, all about power. So let's have some fun. <clears throat> We're going over to Spain now. We're going to look at Francisco Goya's work. And uh, Goya is one of my favorite of the Romantic artists. If we were to look at his career starting early on, um, you would see when he used to work for Charles III that he was pretty happy that his early scenes are these kind of very nice genre scenes where everyone's kind of happy. And then something happens in his career. A bunch of things happen. One of them is that this man, Charles IV, takes over. This is uh, the portrait of Charles IV and his family. And this guy returns, uh, so during the early career of Goya, Spain had revolutionized itself quite a bit. Spain has always been a staunchly conservative, fairly Catholic country, but during the reign of this earlier monarch that was Goya's monarch, he, was, he worked for him, uh, they uh, embraced ideas of the Enlightenment, they were very humanistic, they were sharing ideas, they moved away from this very superstitious a very Catholic kind of uh, you know, approach to things, and Goya loved it. Then this guy comes back into power, and he had lost control of the populace, and so what he decides to do is re-establish the priority of Catholicism within Spain. He is actually one of the first monarchs to burn books. He burned a bunch of French Enlightenment books, uh, and, of course, he put a, a break on the meetings of humanists in Spain, which bummed uh, Goya out. But he still worked for this guy, and he was, of course, called the duty to do what court painters are supposed to do, which is to glorify the family, in this case, in a portrait. But my question to you is, how the hell did he get away with this group portrait? I mean, look at these people very carefully, and tell me, did they not look at this and say, wait a minute, I don't look so great here, what's going on? And what I mean by this is, I think I have a close-up of this. Oh, let's, let's go at these groups. I'll pull back out in a minute, but who thinks Charles is looking his best? And what about her? And what's up with her over here, right? He's obviously, as a modernist would, as I said before, they like to, and we saw this at first with the Mannerists and then in the Baroque period, look at previous artists and kind of redo their work, kind of reimagine how they went at things. So who is the person that he identifies with most? Who is the best painter for these artists at this time in Spain of the past? It's Diego Velasquez. So he looks back at Las Meninas and he wants to do something like that in his own work. So here he is, Goya back here, and here's the edge of that canvas, but everything else is quite a bit different. So again, let's get up here on this. And I just want you to look at these and tell me what you think. How did he get away with this? How did he turn this over to Charles and say, hey, here you go. You're like, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. We don't either. Art historians have been like, I don't know how the hell he got away with this either. I mean, here's the thing. A lot of art historians who haven't done quite all the work they should do Look at this work, and they say, well, maybe it's part of that new realist trend. After all, Romanticism has a good dose of naturalism in it. It's just trying to make it look more realistic. And these guys didn't look that great. I mean, he's a little bit older, so he's got a paunch, and you know, he's got a double chin here, and da 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 I don't know what's going on with her. It's like her, her neck has kind of swallowed her face or something like that. It's not looking great, very elongated. But what if they really look like this? 
But then if you're an art historian, you go look at earlier portraits of these people and you say, do they all look like this? And they don't, right? Earlier studies for this work make them look better. So he's obviously, I think, changed it, altered it to make them look worse than they did before. And then you look at her and you're like, what's going on there? The older someone gets, it looks like the more horrible they're they are as a person. They just look scary. And this woman back here, that on the side of her head is a giant malignant growth. She's got melanoma. She's a goner. She's not going to last long at all. And we know that an artist can just do things like, well, I'm not going to paint that in or put them over in a shadow so you can't see it very well. And he's clearly wanting to emphasize that. Or this guy, who by the way, had it out for his brother, so you can tell that, right? I mean, who wouldn't notice that? Here's your group portrait, and they're like, oh, it looks great. No, I'm sure you could see all this. What is the program here? The younger you are, the more innocent you look, and the more noble is the term we've been using, you are. I mean, this is standard. Again, remember I said the noble savage actually comes from this weird redo of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea that all children, all infants are born in the world innately good and then over the course of their life, civilization corrupts them. And in the Noble Savage, they change that around a little bit, but that's the original idea. And it seems to be an operation here. Certainly someone like Goya would have read uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's writings. Younger you are, the more innocent you are, the older you get, the more corrupted you become. Oh, one last thing. What about her, right? Why is she looking away from the painter right at the moment that he paints this? Well, this one actually has an explanation. This young man, which is the, the crown prince, who, by the way, Goya had all of his money on, like, I hope this guy takes over, I hope he takes over, hadn't picked a wife yet. And Goya, of course, looking at the history of art, knows that this happens all the time where you do your group portrait, you didn't paint in the scene of the woman who later gets you know, married into the family. So instead of uh, painting a face on her and wasting his time, he just paints a body in there, knowing that later on he can go back in and paint a face on whoever this ends up being. So another thing that Goya is really well known for are his prints. And he did two amazing series of prints. You're looking at one print from a series known as Las Caprichas, or the Caprices. He did another series called The Disasters of War. And these are both critical commentaries on his own time. Oftentimes in, in kind of visual languages that was meant to be coded so that people couldn't, couldn't get him in trouble for what he was saying. As a matter of fact, in both cases, the Spanish Inquisition, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, is not a good organization to have on your back, forced him to stop printing these prints. Almost immediately, within the first week that he started running prints, they came to him and said, you're going to be excommunicated and you might be executed. Stop it. So he had to stop it. And they were primarily painted, uh, printed later in his life and posthumously. In any case, one of the easiest to get your, uh, a handle on is this one called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. And so it's a, uh, what's called an etching aquatint. You just need to know that it's an etching. Um, and what we witness here is Goya himself, a self-portrait, at sleep at his table. And from his dreams or from his thoughts while sleeping, emerge all of these creatures associated with the night and with superstition, especially in Spain at the time. So black cats, owls, bats, things associated with evil you know, but only through superstition. And what he's saying is, of course, this is the age in which Charles IV banned various ideas from the Enlightenment, rational investigation of the world. Bats, of course, are not inherently bad, nor are black cats, nor are owls. These are all superstitions. And what he's saying is, if you put to sleep reason, we're going to go right back into this superstitious, ruled by irrational thoughts nation. And do we want that? So when we come back next week, be ready to talk about this. This is the 
third or maybe it's the fourth major romantic work that we've looked at so far. I've got four choices on the table, it seems to me. Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, Caspar David Friedrich's Tetchen or uh, Altar Across in the Mountains, and this work, Goya's the 3rd of May, 1808. But we'll come back to this next week.